I come from a Cuban family. My family immigrated to the United States in Miami, Florida, a couple of years before I was born. My pediatrician was Dr. Marti. My dentist was Dr. Leon. We bought our car from Gus Machado Chevrolet. Our family friend, Theo Carlos, owned a construction company, and he gave my two big brothers their first jobs. And although we were from Cuba and therefore Hispanic, my parents taught me to be proud of the fact that I was black, too. But in the all-black, impoverished area that we grew up in called Liberty City, we weren't supporting each other the way the Cubans did. There was crime. It was a really sad place. My mother was mugged three times, once right in front of my face. So I was happy to run away from Liberty City, and I did to go to college in Atlanta at Emory University. My husband did kind of the same thing. He left Detroit, headed for Harvard University, and after Harvard, he went to Chicago to get his MBA. I did the same thing. I went to Chicago to get my MBA and my law degree from the University of Chicago, where I learned constitutional law from one then Professor Barack Obama, now the President of the United States of America. We fell in love while we were in graduate school. That's John and I, not the President and I. <laughs> Found great success in corporate America, bought a nice home in a pricey suburb, had two beautiful babies, and were living out our dream life. I found my North Star. But I had to abandon Liberty City and run away from Liberty City to get that North Star. So I wanted to do something, now that I had my North Star, to give back to my community. So this Afro-Cubana, conceived of and created the Empowerment Experiment. Wait, let's go back. The Empowerment Experiment, my family's historic pledge where we committed to completely live off the African-American community for one year, spend all of our money with black businesses for one year. It was tough living like that, really tough. We were disappointed, no, actually shocked, by the number of markets and industries where blacks in America suffer from a complete lack of representation. It was hurtful, fearful, being called a racist, a Nazi, and the other N-word, just because I decided to give one year of my life to my community. It was tormenting, humiliating, going through these all-black areas of Chicago, trudging through the economic deprivation and the social decay, taking PBS NewsHour and CBS News, all-white camera crews and correspondents, watching them as they shook their heads, as we went door to door, store to store. Hi, we're doing a story on black businesses. May we meet your owner? And going blocks, miles, before encountering a black proprietor. I didn't want to put the economic demise of my community on front pages across the globe. It hurt as a black woman to see that. And I know I hurt some feelings to show you that, but I wanted to bring you in and take you there, and maybe you would see something that you didn't want to see, but you needed to see, and hopefully wanted to understand. I wanted you to meet Jordan. I met this pretty little girl during our year. I would have never met Jordan or anywhere, gone anywhere near Bronzeville, where Jordan lives, had it not been for that year. Bronzeville is a dilapidated area on the south side of Chicago, pretty run down, a lot of drugs, crime, depression. Still, our young Jordan dreamt of opening a children's clothing store in that neighborhood. And she did, with her mother and her grandmother and her grandfather's life savings. They called it Jordan's Closets, and it was the most beautiful children's clothing store I'd ever seen. On Saturdays, they would host book clubs and tea parties for little girls in the communities. And on Sunday, Jocelyn, her mom, had modeling classes and a charm school for little girls in the community. Jordan's Closets is closed. Abandoned space destroyed dream. And so it is in Bronzeville. Abandoned space destroyed dream after destroyed dream. So when I say empowered community, do you think of the African-American community? Actually, you should. After emancipation in the early 1900s, African-Americans had amassed great business power. Most well-documented examples are in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Durham, North Carolina. Those areas were called Black Wall Streets, 
We had hospitals, insurance companies, banks, department stores, drug stores, all kinds of uh, professionals and stores thrived. There were hundreds of millions of dollars created and recycled in the African-American community. No gains, no violence. If anything, most of that stuff came from the outside at that time, if you know what I mean. Actually, black unemployment up through 1940 was lower than that of whites in America. So the African-American community at one point did achieve its North Star. But what about now? In the Asian community in America now, the dollars recycled among the community's banks, retailers, and professionals for about 28 days before it's spent with outsiders. In the Jewish community, that circulation period is about 19 days. In the black community, in Jordan's community, the dollar lives for six hours. Six hours. Now, you start to see certain intangibles with those communities where the dollar has an extended period of life. So in the Jewish community and in the Asian American community, you'll see higher levels of business success, more self-employment, lower unemployment, high, uh, high academic achievement, more home ownership. And that's great for our Asian and Jewish friends. That's great for America. But I dream of an America where possibly folks like you would be shopping at a retailer started by an African-American family, or maybe staying at a hotel started by an African-American firm. I dream of an America where it's not a ridiculous notion to a black child that he, too, can own a drugstore, or that she can become the next leading hammer manufacturer. I dream of an America where it's, there's some reciprocity for what's going on in our community, an America where the black community is not the only place where every ethnic group can set up shop and thrive, and a community in America where there's some reciprocity for that. So how do we get to that America? How do we get to that America? Could it be those six hours? Let's ask the best business school in the world, Kellogg Graduate School of Management at Northwestern University. Kellogg conducted a landmark study based on my family's year. And they found, of course, that out of the $1 trillion in African-American buying power, 2% of that goes back into the community, just 2%. But they also found that if middle-class African-American households, households like mine with $75,000 household income or more, were to increase that spending from 2% to 10%. No one's saying only support black businesses. 2% to 10%, we could create a million jobs. I don't think this thing is on. I said 1 million jobs in underserved black areas with an incremental shift in our spending. So maybe there is something to the six hours. So you know what I do about that? Twice a week, I go to forest cleaners on the west side of Chicago. The west side of Chicago is a self-destructive place. It's an awful place, and Forest Cleaners is one of the few African-American-owned businesses in this all-black part of town. James Forrest, everyone calls him Uncle James, is the owner of Forest Cleaners, and he's a shining example to the young kids in that community that if they want to aspire to entrepreneurial success, they don't have to be a gangbanger or a drug dealer. So that's why I go to Forest Cleaners. A year ago, I uh, spoke at Suffolk University in Boston. Uh, a woman named Debbie came, and she bought my book, read it, wrote me, and said that she wanted some black businesses to support. I gave her a few. She was very happy with the, the service and, and the products that she received. She told her friends, her peers, her clients to support that business, too. And they did. By the way, did I mention that my friend Debbie is white? Selena and Kari Cuff this beautiful couple here, Harvard MBAs, they created Heritage Link Brands, a wine company, when they learned in 2005 that the South African wine industry had amassed $3 billion, and less than 2% of that comes from black wine companies, even though 80% of the, of the population in South Africa is black. So now, Heritage Link Brands is the biggest company in the wine industry importing and marketing black-produced wines throughout Africa. One of those wines is Seven Sisters Wines. These beautiful sisters had to leave their South Africa town at a very early age due to apartheid. 
Now, 20 years later, they've come back and reunited and started this wonderful wine company. My favorite wine from Seven Sisters is Buca Trabe, and I drink a lot of Buca Trabe, but mostly to join Selena and Kari and these beautiful sisters to reverse the ruins of apartheid. You all know P. Diddy. P. Diddy owns uh, Sean John. It's a clothing brand at Macy's. I go to Macy's all the time, but now I look for Sean John and I buy my nephew's T-shirts and jeans so that I can support this wonderful black business owner. Just last year, P. Diddy gave over a million dollars to Howard Business School, not too far from here, to help more young African Americans get into business. So when I buy those jeans, I'm helping invest in vital entrepreneurship and educational opportunities. So here's the point. You don't have to live in a struggling community to empower it. You don't have to see or go through what I went through to want to empower struggling communities. You don't have to be an activist to do what I do. Think about those marchers who marched with Dr. King during the Civil Rights Movement. Struggling, successful, educated, uneducated, professionals, laborers. But they came together, black, some not black, but they came together united by their hopes and their willingness to act. And together, they used their economic power in that boycott to create social change in a violent and segregated South. My mother never graduated high school, just a Cuban farm girl. And I'm about to wrap up with this tribute. Just a Cuban farm girl. But she was the most brilliant woman I'd ever know, the bravest woman I'd ever know. She came to this country, been here 40 years, never even learned how to drive. In 2008, Mima was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. This was right before we decided to launch our experiment. Of course, I was going to throw the, uh, call the whole thing off. Mima didn't let me. She said this would be the most important thing I'd ever do. Mima lived way past the one month that the doctors gave her. She lived 18 months with pancreatic cancer and died in my arms as I held her just after we finished our historic year. She was able to see her baby girl do the most important thing that, she, that she'd ever do. And although he thinks it's cute, it hurts when Papa says to me that she lived that long just to make sure that I did what she told me to do. <laughs> but now that she's gone, I cry wondering, did I waste that last year with my mother, fighting for something that would never change, could never even be penetrated, and not because the white man has his foot on our necks, but simply because no matter how much I get to this, no matter how many studies we generate, how much media attention we earn, my community just won't come together and support one another again. Or the larger community won't accept or come to believe that the what we see in the struggling community now is not a reflection of our potential, our promise, or our propensities. The larger community won't come together like we did in the past for economic empowerment the way we did for human and civil rights. But then Mima shows me people like Debbie and Uncle James and Jordan and the Brutus family, strangers sharing a sense of community, strangers building an empowered community. That's the whole point. That's all I'm trying to tell y'all today. Today is not about one extreme thing that I did for one year. It's about the little things that we all can do every day. So think about your North Star. Think about the North Star and what it really means. The North Star is not just there to guide you when you need it. The beauty, the power of the North Star is that whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you're from, anyone, anywhere, everyone, everywhere can see it. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me share our story today. Thank you for believing in empowered communities.